Hello, uh, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Oh, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're joining from. Uh, let's give a minute to allow people to join in from the previous session, then we can kick off. Okay, the clock has ticked over. <clears throat> I think we're good to start now. Um, morning, everyone, um, or afternoon or evening, depending on where you're joining from. Hope you're enjoying the conference so far. Uh, in this session, I would like to talk about how we used Apache Kafka to scale the Betfair exchange to supporting um, a load, customer load of up to 160,000 requests per second, and how Kafka played a central role in <clears throat> us achieving this uh, target. Um, firstly, who we are, um, Betfair <coughs> was a company that was founded in the year 2000, and it's the largest online betting exchange in the world. We offer a very unique betting experience uh, to the customers, uh, where we allow people to bet against each other rather than betting against an operator, which makes us uh, one of a kind in the world. And we <clears throat> have been growing steadily over the past few years, especially in the last four or five years, we have seen massive growth in uh, with the merger and acquisition of <clears throat> different entities and different, different businesses in different parts of the world. And currently we are part of Flutter Group. Um, Betfair is one brand out of um, many that Flutter owns. Paddy Power, FanDuel, and Foxbet, um, <clears throat> being a few of them. Skybet and gaming within the UK. Um, I work as a architect at the Betfair Exchange platform, and I've been with Betfair for about ten years now. Uh, first of all, what is the betting exchange? How does the betting exchange currently work? Let me just describe very briefly uh, how the exchange actually works. As I said before, it's a peer-to-peer -peer betting platform, which means it allows customers to bet against each other rather than betting against an operator, which means it provides better odds and better prices to the <coughs> end users. Um, and we offer recreational um, betting people who are uh, betting for fun uh, there's also a whole lot of customers that we have who are who take betting very seriously and are able <clears throat> and have made it their profession by creating uh, automated trading bots either individually or as professional businesses and trade huge amounts on the betfair exchange um, we offer different kinds of events to customers to bet on uh, which span mainly the sporting world and we allow people to gamble on the sporting events across the world but politics and certain special events um, <clears throat> as well um, we offer uh, a unique experience to the customers in in the sense that there's different outcomes available for customers to bet on and the customers have the option to either back a particular outcome saying the the outcome is going to 
uh, happen with a particular probability or they can lay <coughs> a particular outcome saying they can place a bet saying a particular outcome is not going to happen which makes it a very uh, interesting and unique experience to the customers so we are dependent on <coughs> basically a critical mass of customers coming into our platform and being able to trade on different outcomes at different odds at any point in time. Um, and at the core of all of this is a very efficient matching algorithm, which matches customers' bets against each other, uh, depending on various criteria. Um, so how does the betting um, actually work um, if you're talking about a professional um, customer who is using a lot of money and trading on this platform. It typically works as a in this cycle. Uh, at the top of the cycle, you will see um, that the first thing that the customers do uh, using various channels, whether it's the website or whether it's a mobile application or whether it's using an API uh, automated trading, uh, you have to discover the markets that are available, the betting opportunities that are currently available where people can place bets. Um, the opportunities can be in terms of uh, a football match or a, a, a polit political event. Uh, but the first aspect is to be able to discover what markets are currently available and they are automatically created based on feeds that we receive from external providers as and when the real world entities are actually uh, <coughs> taking place. The real world match, uh, match is being available. <coughs> And once the matches are finished, the markets are settled. So the customer at any point in time has to know um, what markets are currently available. And the customer then goes on to check the state of the market to see what op outcomes are available, what odds are available for him to bet on. And based on his strategy, he calculates his position and walks out, these are the trades I want to place in this particular market. And he goes ahead and does that. <coughs> Um, and once he's placed his bets, the bets have to match against uh, other customers. So he has to constantly keep checking his position. And this uh, cycle has to go on very, very fast as with a very low latency and high frequency for uh, especially the really professional uh, high frequency, low latency uh, traders. Um, the cycles can be <coughs> sub-second. Um, so uh, you can imagine we need to be able to provide interfaces for the customers to be able to do all of this in a very uh, quick turnaround time. Uh, if we look at this in terms of um, the load profile as to what each of these um, operations actually um, are seen at um, on a very busy time. Let's say a Saturday afternoon is a very busy time for us. Um, so the discovery API or the catalog API can get up to 15,000 requests per second. Um, uh, the market read API, which allows the customers to check the current state of the market can go up to 95 or even 100,000 requests per second. Um, some of these figures are slightly outdated, but effectively this is the proportion that we are talking about. And one the bet placement API or the transactional API goes up to a few thousands requests per second. And once again, the bet read API once the, which allows the customers to read their positions um, very uh, <clears throat> at low latency can go up to 40 to 50,000 requests per second. But overall, you can see there's about uh, uh, 98 percent, more than 95, 90 percent of the load is actually uh, heavily read based and only about two to three percent of the load is actually the transactional load. So all our systems are heavily uh, optimized for read load. Um, a few years ago, we had a software architecture which was uh, started creaking and which has been around for almost a decade and was reaching the end of its life cycle. So it was a monolithic architecture, a single application that was built around JBoss and you deploy it um, into a cluster of, uh, I don't know, 18 nodes. And <clears throat> the, it connects to an Oracle database, which is used as a storage and it provides the website as well as it provided an API endpoint for the customers to uh, place their bets and view the markets. Uh, as it is, it was a monolithic architecture and it had various shortcomings. Um, there was also um, a, <clears throat> a legacy 
sort of event stream producer stack, which was based on effectively multicast, UDP-based multicast, and it was uh, unreliable. Um, this is basically to make sure we can propagate the changes that are happening within the exchange to all the web and the API nodes as fast as possible. It had a lot of issues. Uh, as such, it was unreliable being based on UDP and there was heavy reliance on the database. So at the bottom of all of this is a very um, <clears throat> monolithic oracle database instance which takes which is probably one of the busiest um, um, heaviest used um, oracle databases within europe i would say at that time and because of the reliance on the db there is a limit uh, that's placed on how how many nodes can actually connect to the db how quickly you can get the data out of the db and propagate it to the customers and all sorts of things and beyond a certain point it does not scale and we started seeing heavy issues especially on saturday afternoon during busy times we used to lose entire clusters and um, <clears throat> it was it was a um, very, very bad for the business um, and on top of it most of it was legacy code so there's very little knowledge within the company to be able to make effective changes to those applications so it was very difficult to make any changes so at that point we decided that we need to rewrite this entire stack and i would not go into details of what we replaced it with but effectively it's a, a proprietary framework that we developed that allows you to um, build different apis um, <clears throat> with some nfrs um, that that are automatically taken care of but effectively the design was the same so instead of, of the monolithic jboss um, environment we split it into a number of microservices but it was still reliant on the same database and the um, legacy udp based event stream architecture and there was a limit uh, that was hit um, with this even with the newly written api based on the legacy architecture we were not able to scale it beyond 16000 requests per second now we had already communicated to the customers that we would be bringing out a new version of the api which is faster and more resilient about a year ahead of its um, actual date uh, because we need to allow people to um, be able to rewrite their <coughs> bots using the new newer apis so we had a hard deadline to hit but we found that the limit with the legacy architecture was around 16,000 requests per second, which was nowhere enough to cater to the load of that day, let alone the future load. So we had to quickly regroup and build something new because basically we had a ticking time bomb on our hands. So we needed what we needed was to build a new, completely new stream of data. That event stream should be able to um, contain or represent the entire state of the exchange and also be able to produce the changes as quickly as possible uh, as close to when they're actually happening in real time so which means the very high um, very low latency requirements and it also meant that we needed to have um, we needed to design the stream to allow different apis which are basically representing the state of the exchange in different forms um, to be built quickly and to be able to gather the data from the stream efficiently, either at bootstrap time or at runtime. And it needs to be scalable. The number of consumers would um, grow very rapidly from what we knew at that point in time. So we needed something that's very scalable and of course reliable because we had problems on every Saturday afternoon and we did not want something that was some um, <clears throat> unreliable or not able to cope with failures as easily as the whole stack <clears throat> or and we obviously the latency requirements and as efficient the data needs to be represented as efficiently as possible using um, whatever was the state of the art um, serialization deserialization techniques available at that point in time um, Having all this in mind, we developed uh, concepts, a few concepts around how we develop these streams. Uh, so I'll just highlight a couple of uh, patterns that we used. So one of them being the, um, we used a in-band snapshot and delta model. What this basically means is um, every stream or a topic uh, basically contains uh, uh, messages which are, which represent um, 
either deltas or individual changes as they are happening or they can also represent a snapshot a snapshot of a of an entity is will capture the complete state of the entity at that point in time um, so effectively we will be representing the changes as they happen as deltas well very tiny which meant that if a bet gets placed it's a very tiny message that we need to send and at the same time in order to allow uh, stateful consumers to be built periodically every 10 minutes we also build a snapshot of the entire state of the exchange and publish it out onto the stream using the same structures of messages but with certain headers and certain variables to indicate that this is actually a snapshot rather than a pure delta so this meant that uh, we were able to create consumers who on bootstrap on startup time if they need to build an entire view of the exchange they would rewind back from the uh, top of the queue <clears throat> until you hit a uh, actual snapshot message and then replay all the messages back from that point um, onwards and you have the complete state built already so this was quite handy because uh, all you needed to build a service with a stateful service which can uh, serve the traffic over http was just pointed at this topic and we were able to just um, create a service very very easily and there was a problem with it being the size of the snapshots themselves the bigger your snapshot the bigger larger the number of entities that you have the um, the higher the delay can be in producing a snapshot and effectively you might see some um, latency between the snapshot and the next delta that's queued up behind it but it 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 worked out fine for us for the kind of data set that we had at that point in time to follow this model as it was a very simplistic model. Um, so yeah, so this allowed us to build stateful consumers of um, um, exchange data very quickly and easily. Uh, as an example, we can probably see here <coughs> um, a, a representation of a market view. Uh, this shows a Liverpool versus West Ham football match or match odds match on a Saturday afternoon. And <coughs> the grid basically shows the different odds at which different amounts of money is available to bet on. And um, the entire grid for this market represents basically one market view or one snapshot. Um, whereas the deltas can can be the individual cells that you see. Um, so as and when the new bets get placed, we will see the delta messages appearing and periodically we'll have a snapshot which represents the entire market view. So that's a very simplistic example of how the stream would look like. Um, so that worked for certain kinds of data that we had to represent and <clears throat> the data that was not too huge. Um, in certain other cases we were we hit a roadblock or we hit a problem with the data set actually the data model being uh, quite big and the amount of data that you needed to kind of cache and snapshot is quite large running into a few gigs in those cases those the latencies on if we included the snapshots in band the latency introduced in the stream itself would have been quite high so in this cases we um, went for out of band snapshot uh, strategy so we had two streams or two topics basically one for deltas and one for snapshots and there is a single producer that is responsible for producing the deltas as as and when it happens in real time the new bets and new orders are coming into the system the deltas are being represented sent out onto the delta stream and periodically say every 30 minutes or every 60 minutes the snapshot cycle kicks in and we basically end up um, serializing an entire snapshot of all the uh, of the entire state of of the exchange at that point in time and the ex and the snapshot is written to a separate topic um, <clears throat> which means that the advantage of this is that you can have um, large data sets being represented quite in a rather efficient way and it also allows two kinds of consumers to have to to have two kinds of consumers the uh, stateless consumers who are just representing or who are just interested in the deltas or, or the orders that are coming in and not really interested in bootstrapping themselves with the entire st current state who are just kind of reacting to events that are happening so you could have those stateless consumers and you could also have stateful consumers for the stateful consumers we <clears throat> they would bootstrap themselves with the out of band snapshot 
topic uh, the key thing here or the key concept here is that the the snapshot every snapshot that gets generated has a pointer into the delta stream um, to that points to the offset where the particular uh, snapshot was actually generated which basically means uh, someone who is bootstrapping themselves from this particular snapshot will have to connect to uh, build up their state using the snapshot entirely and then connect to the delta stream from offset 511 as shown here and play uh, play the messages from that point onwards so they're able to build those messages very easily and very uh, <coughs> consume the messages and build up their state very easily and very efficiently um, so this allowed us to represent different kinds of um, data models there are a few other strategies which probably will um, but these were the two prime examples um, so this was about how we wanted to represent the data on different topics and how we are able to just make sure that the entire state of the exchange which is centrally held in a single database can be um, in its entirety exposed on um, on on the streams allowing consumers to be built and the other key decisions that we made was to use protocol buffers to actually encode this data a lot of the data a majority of the data is numeric and protocol buffers is um, really good really efficient at uh, <coughs> serializing um, numeric data so we ran an exercise with different kinds of encodings that, that were available at that time and protocol buffers were by, by far the best we also made sure we built some reusable consumer libraries which encoded or encapsulated all the business logic which i just explained in previous slides about how we bootstrap ourselves so that <coughs> so, so that every consumer doesn't need to reinvent the same way across the business so those we made sure that those patterns were encoded in those libraries and those libraries were available to <clears throat> all the consumers um, and of course underpinning all of these things is um, was a single uh, kafka instance at that point in time we chose kafka because it was um, by far the most reliable and the resilient platform out there which had a lot of traction in the open source community as well so it was quite crucial for us to kind of look at um, something that has got a lot of flying hours um, out there and it was known to be quite resilient and reliable um, so this was roughly the oversimplification of the architecture that we ended up with so all the changes that are stored and happening in the database there's a producer uh, application which is kind of observing the database for any new changes that are happening and is able to work out effectively what is a material change that has happened um, in the database um, regarding the state of the exchange and be able to kind of um, serialize that and send it out as deltas and snapshots onto a Kafka topic which meant all the services the service layer above were did not need to have any connection back into the database and just could completely run off the Kafka's, which meant that we could scale much, much easier than the previous platform. So this is the prototype of the POC that we built. And our Kafka setup initially looked something like this. We had a three host cluster with a three replication factor of three. Um, reasonably beefy boxes, I would say, uh, physical boxes, 24 CPU, 32 GB RAM, and uh, six disks in each of them and over 100 consumers with this setup we were able to get uh, very very good performance and we were able to achieve a level of reliability that we had not seen before at that point in time this screenshot as you see is slightly old um, <clears throat> but i just wanted to highlight the fact that we were able to run for 1658 days which is roughly about four and a half years for about uh, without without a downtime, um, without um, any problems as such, um, which was crucial to how, uh, <clears throat> um, which was one of the fundamental problems we had in the previous iteration or the previous generation of applications we had reliability problem. So Kafka helped us address that very uh, efficiently. Um, some key metrics, I can see there's a question around the throughput, so I'm happy to answer that. Uh, offline where well, there are some key metrics this is again like i said uh, slightly outdated but we are able to achieve um, similar <coughs> performance in our current estate with a much bigger estate um, 
this was the performance of a single cluster, three node cluster that we achieved, um, which was um, which 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 helped us um, become much more stable and improve our conf uh, improve the business confidence in our in our technology department as such to to say that we are able to make very large engineering changes um, and provide. Um, um, <coughs> much better performance and throughput than we used to be able to in the past with um, reasonable reasonably small effort so so now we had the old stack and which was reaching its limits and we had the new stack so how do we go about actually migrating the customers um, <clears throat> so we decided to run the both the stacks in parallel um, there's a legacy stack and the new stack with some throttling of traffic between the two, um, which meant that we were able to kind of dial up or dial down the traffic from the old stack to the new stack um, on a very uh, on a periodic basis to, to see if there is a problem that we saw on the new stack, we could immediately dial it back to the old stack and <clears throat> um, quickly fix the problem, iterate over it and release, release a change very quickly without actually any a major impact on any of the running systems and then dial things back so that allowed us a level of flexibility that we did not have before but this also meant that because we were um, running um, with a completely standalone kafka stack we were able to replicate the data from production into a sort of pre-production environment we, so that allowed us to test our services with actual real world data but without actually affecting any of the real world systems that we were running which was uh, again something that we did not have before and we were we were able to catch so many problems before we actually hit production with that um, with that approach so all of this was possible because we we were able to have a kafka uh, um, based architecture with Kafka at the center. And there was minimal customer impact, the minimal DB impact. And finally, we were able to scale up to 32 nodes um, with each host being able to support around 5,000 requests. So that's about 160,000 requests per second um, in total. Um, so effectively, what we tried to do is run the new stack, then remove some of the old service to reduce the load on the DB and replicate the same, use the same boxes to um, <clears throat> run the new new design or the new architecture. Um, this allowed us to do the migration as seamlessly as possible. And finally, we were able to switch off the entirety of the old stack um, and reduce the load on the database in, in the, in the <clears throat> process of it so what did we achieve of course the migration was pretty seamless because of how we um, designed the whole thing with with the ability to throttle um, the C migration was pretty sm smooth there were a few glitches here and there but no major glitches that we uh, that affected the business um, and, and we were able to scale to four times or five times the load that number of nodes that we had in the past, which meant that we didn't have to scale for another, we had the capacity or the headroom for another year or a couple of years very easily. Um, and because we had the rewind and replay capabilities available from Kafka, uh, we were able to diagnose the problems in production much, much quicker and provide fixes a lot more easily than we used to be able to in the past. And the whole thing meant that we could <clears throat> develop all the solutions, all our uh, um future uh, designs in a much more agile way um so that is one of the key um use cases or the prime use cases that we had and Kef how we use kafka to actually solve those problems for us uh, another problem that <coughs> we came across not too um in the not too distant past um, as i said as we grew as a business we uh, <clears throat> FanDuel is a company in, in the US and we were able to um, effectively merge with that uh, entity and we wanted to basically expose the catalog data that we had uh, um, 
within within the within our uk platform and reuse the same catalog same set of markets and competitions and uh, offerings available and make it available to the fan dual customers in in america rather than rebuilding the whole system from scratch we wanted to reuse as much of the data that we have as possible and reuse as much of the systems as possible <clears throat> and we had very aggressive scale up plans as well um, to scale to um, multiple different states very very quickly over, over the period of few months rather than a few years so we were based on a, the entire catalog model was based on this similar db centric architecture in the past so we had a set of api nodes which would actually just directly pull the data from the db and with some caching involved um, so they were able to provide a low latency api but um still heavily db centric um, the architecture that we went with was to create a producer stack uh, in the middle and use a kafka to actually distribute the catalog data uh, from our data centers in <coughs> ireland to our us based data centers over a cross atlantic link um, and this was very crucial to our cross brand uh, growth as we wanted to um, leverage most of the capabilities that we already had in one brand to power another brand. Um, so we were able to scale in less than a year or maybe just, just around a year's time to 10 different states. So effectively, we exported the catalog data on a periodic basis to a central Kafka installation in, in the states and from there we are able to distribute that data to different services running in different states much more efficiently uh, rather than having all of those services call back into our data center um, directly through to gather the data from the database uh, this was a lot more efficient model the challenges were slightly different here so we did not have to represent the same um, deltas and snapshots instead we went for just um, periodic snapshots here which are produced more frequently like every 30 seconds or so which meant that <coughs> um, we we needed to be very efficient in how we encode the snapshots and uh, how quickly we can actually produce produce the snapshot back to the uh, us based data centers um, <coughs> and we had some reliability issues as expected because it's a cross atlantic link and um, we all know it's not, it cannot be as reliable as a data center, something that's running within a data center, but um, <clears throat> we designed around it so that we can be, cope with some failures um, with some alerting here and there, but not actually compromising the end customer experience. Um, so this is another uh, prime use case where Kafka was at the kind of core at the center of our um, approach and it helped us expand helped us grow the business in <coughs> a very short period of time and there are some enhancements that we're still planning on top of this but this is effectively um, how it looks currently um, well once we have more um, as you may guess, um, more DB centric problems um, that we have uh, within the exchange per se to, um, so this is a typical bed placement flow um, that, that you could look at, um, no oversimplification, but obviously there's a input handler as the orders come into the system, which does a lot of validation and risk management account the account against the accounts and uh, checking whether the markets are valid or the, or the customer is allowed to place a bet in this market based on certain jurisdiction rules and stuff like that so there's a set of validations that happen and then the bets get effectively written into a into the database which, which serves as a input queue effectively so it's a table that serves as a queue uh, to the order processor or the order matcher uh, it is responsible for matching the bets customers bets against each other um, so it picks up the bets from the database and um, finds the appropriate bet to match against and then writes the output back into the database again. And once the output of the processor or the matcher is written down into the database, all the stack that the, I described in the previous use cases come into picture in order to distribute that data to the rest of the world. So obviously you can see that there's a 
many hops in into and out of the database in this flow there's uh, more complexity to this but this is a simplific simplification of it just for for the sake of uh, explanation here <clears throat> so obviously the limit here was the input queue so how many transactions can be written into the database at a, within a short space of time and how many can be read out and we estimated that we had a limit of around 2500 transactions to be written down into the database um, per second and that would be the limit per connection we could obviously increase the number of connections but that has a cost um, in it in itself so we are in the middle of rewriting some of this flow um, to use a Kafka in between and use Kafka as the reliable input queue for our system. And um, with this model, we were able to go up to 25,000 transactions per second, if not more. We haven't actually hit the limits, but this was kind of a very high um, <clears throat> number already compared to the previous limits that we had. Um, Again, this is um, this is something that's currently being modeled and in progress. Um, but this is one of the other challenges where we think Kafka can actually help us solve a core problem that we have, a fundamental limitation we have in our system. Um, and there are a lot more future challenges, of course, where Kafka can be useful. We are developing a lot of operational streams which stream out the operational data, um, as, which give a slightly different view of what's happening within the system, kind of an audit audit of what's happening within the system. And using that, we will be powering a lot of our sort of data warehouse and data lake kind of functions. Um, there is personalization work that's happening using same Kafka stack and a lot of <clears throat> we all we are also able to uh, sort of record the changes as they are happening within within the Kafka and then be able to package uh, the entire life cycle th the activity that happened within the life cycle of a market and sort of sell those uh, to customers who are able to create their bots and train their bots um, Based, based on based on the activities they see in those files. So all of this is possible only because of Kafka at, at its core. Without Kafka, we would not be able to achieve this level of flexibility and this, this variety of different functionalities within what we have today. And before I sign off, uh, just uh, if any of these challenges uh, sound very interesting to you, you would like to be part of solving some of these problems we are always looking for uh, good developers at all experience uh, um, we are if you want to um, help us solve some of these problems and build the next generation of the platform that powers the exchange feel free to get in touch um, i'll post the slides um, and the links as well uh, later on and feel free to have a look at some of our blogs entries as well i think there's we capture quite good information about what what are, what are all the stuff that we are doing within ppb technology so feel free to have a look and that is all i had to present today thank you very much for listening and for your time um, i'm not sure if we have time enough for questions here but feel free to get in touch with me we can have a conversation on the QA q a or we can also meet up on the birds of feather sessions later on um, once again thank you very much for listening